Hi, I'm Johnny Beyer, the Executive Director of the American Banjo Museum in Oklahoma City. Today, as we lead up to our 2020 American Banjo Museum Hall of Fame inductions, coming up this Friday, October 16th at 7 p.m. Central, you're all invited to join us, by the way, we're going to be talking to some of our inductees. Today, we're going to be dealing with a guy that uh, you might know as Biscuit. His name is Gary Davis. He is without a doubt one of the most respected five-string banjoists in the world. He's a multi-instrumentalist. Uh, he's also one of the better entertainers that sat behind a banjo ever. And he's about the most humble person you'll ever get a chance to lay your eyes on. We're going to try and get him out of his shell a little bit today and learn about Gary Davis. Gary, welcome to the American Banjo Museum Hall of Fame. A very well-deserved honor. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you. Wow. It is a true honor. I appreciate uh, even the chance to be part of this. Well, you are obviously one of the uh, people that's been high on our list for a long, long time. We love what you do. You've had a really, really interesting career and something a little bit outside of the ordinary for guys who are in the world of bluegrass. But we want to go back to the start. When did you first hear a banjo in person and how did it affect you and make you want to be a banjo player yourself? I was 10 years old. My dad was going to these little once a month jam sessions and uh, in, in town in Red Bank, Tennessee. And he would disappear once a, once a month like that. It was real uncharacteristic. But anyhow, I, I finally, after a couple of months, coaxed him into letting me go listen to this music. And I sat down and uh, some of the banjo greats were were there. There were some local greats at which were doing stuff in Nashville too. Yeah, you know, I'm based out of Chattanooga and I heard heard Ed Brown, uh, Freddie Sullivan and a bunch of the guys there playing and that banjo. To me it felt like I was sitting there beside somebody with a race car revving the engine. It made me so excited I didn't know what to do. So that really is what clinched me hearing that speed on that banjo. When you heard it and knew you wanted to be a banjo player, when did you get your first banjo? How did that come about? Yeah, well, my, my dad, I kept telling him I was playing sports, football and baseball at that age. He got me one for my 10th birthday, and that was in 73. And uh, one of those guys at that jam session came over and set the banjo up for me and wrote down the, the roll patterns, the bluegrass, the three finger roll patterns and taught me how to practice them. I couldn't get a teacher for about six months, four or five months on a waiting list because it was during when all the dueling banjo stuff was going on. Everybody wanted banjo. So I, it took that long to get a teacher to even get started. My guess is that you taught yourself an awful lot in that six months. Did you acquire any bad skills that you had to correct when you started taking lessons? Actually, I didn't because all I knew was the roles. And so he taught me hand position, how to play with clarity and on the picks and everything. So that's how I teach to this day, exactly how Freddie Sullivan came over and taught me those. And I was still going to those jam sessions. Dad would take me once a month and I would show up and they would play three or four songs and they'd be standing up and this 10 year old kid sitting in the floor over here waiting and they would all look over at me and say, play it banjo boy. And I, all I would do is just take off on rolls, you know. I sit there and do that for a minute and stop and they go, boy, he's doing good. And then they'd go back to playing four or five songs and then they'd turn around Play us another one, boy. So <laughs> that's how I learned, just getting great at the rolls as best I could. So I could play rolls, the speeds of all the songs that they were playing by the time I started learning songs. <laughs> Outside of the local guys that you had mentioned already, uh, who were some of the national banjo influences that you really gravitated to when you were learning? Well, the local guys would, I didn't know any different. I just thought, they were, that was all they were, was those guys and how great they were. So they would start talking about Earl Scruggs uh, or Don Reno. And in that area, that was the main players, except Ed Brown and Freddie, they were a lot of melodic style, but that was still foreign to me. So dad would save a little, buy me a, an LP of Flatten Scruggs or somebody back in the day would make me an eight track 
of all of their records and I'd have Ralph Stanley and the Stanley brothers or, or um, Bill Monroe, you know, when you could hear all the great banjo players with him, I would listen to that. So it was Scruggs, uh, Reno, the Stanley brothers and Bill Monroe on, on eight tracks. You started playing professionally while you were still, you know, basically a kid and working almost 250 nights a year. How did that work out with school and family? And did music just completely consume your life at that point? Actually, it did. I, when I was started playing, my, my mom would they'd say, Gary, it's time for bed. So I would go up and practice, lay in the bed and practice with it, lean back here and I'd fall asleep and she would come take it off of me. And then the next morning I'd get up before school and she'd say, all right, it's almost time to go. And I'd be down there playing. I'd get up in time to play before school. So I, like my dad says, she'd, I'd always say, mom, just let me play Cripple Creek one more time before I had to shoot out the door to get on the bus, run down the path to the elementary school. Yeah, now that commitment went both ways. You're uh, going to festivals and, uh, and such was a family affair, wasn't it? Uh, especially when you couldn't drive to yourself to get to these things. Oh, exactly. Yeah, the back before I started playing with some groups, mom and dad, they we didn't have campers. They'd take the take the old Buick or the old pickup truck with a cover on the bed. We'd camp out in those and they'd haul me to be around all of that and to get to meet people, you know. And my sister was playing softball full time. They, they I don't know how they got us all where we needed to be, but, but that hauling me around all that time was a uh, was a chore for them and I'm sure they had to, dad worked a lot of overtime to make enough gas money to get me there and back too. You're a very lucky kid, let's put it that way. Let's move a little, little bit forward in time. You went to the Walnut Valley Festival in Winfield, Kansas for the first time and that was a life-changing experience for you. I know how it happened, but I'd like to get it in your words. Uh, tell us about your first trip to Winfield. So the first trip we made to Winfield, Kansas wasn't even for me the a guitar player as of now he's the three-time national flat pit guitar champion just like uh, steve kaufman and several others and uh, we went he wanted to go enter the guitar competition we didn't even know there was having a banjo contest there so we took roy curry out and we stayed in uh, sepulpa with some friends that lived there it was my mom and dad's best friend from chattanooga originally we went and stayed with them and drive back and forth and enjoy the festival and Roy got to enter the contest and we found out about, well, there's a banjo contest. So dad said, well, we're out this far out. Let's just keep him out of school another day and, and let him enter. And I was 16. That was in 1979 and wound up uh, winning that year. And there, there was a uh, 40 entrants. There's 40 people can enter and they cut off after that. And, there was a three-way tie to get into the finals, and I was one of those. And then we went into the, I had to play a second tie off and then went into the finals and won. Wow, now I'm gonna get ahead of the story. Uh, you're the only person in the history of Winfield to have won that competition four different times. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but I just wanna tease the folks a little bit and let them know that you are quite uh, a historical figure in the world of Winfield banjo. Uh, but Winfield wasn't the first competition. You did uh, state competitions before that, correct? Yeah, yeah, my dad, uh, they found out about, you know, like local fiddle contests and stuff. and. We'd go, and but then they started finding out about the state competitions, like the Tennessee State Championships over in Clarksville, Tennessee, and then uh, the Kentucky State Championship in the uh, Rough River area in uh, Kentucky, the same in Huntsville, Alabama. So we started, they'd haul me to those, and uh, I started winning those things. I guess I won Tennessee when I was 12. And back then they didn't have a youth competition. You were, you entered the banjo as a banjo. There wasn't a youth banjo and then adult. I had to learn how to compete with all the other guys. But most of the time when I was there, it was I, I wanted to go to see all my buddies and we jammed the whole time. And there's a experience, I'll tell you, it's funny about that. His mom, like with Mike Snyder, he, he was a good friend and we would, um, 
be out in a van or under a tree somewhere playing and here comes my mom and his mom saying, my Gary, they're calling your name on stage. Get up here. You know, I have to come find us to go play in the contest. And <laughs> so, so it was a big family affair. But so through all that time playing those contests, it was a it was a great, great experience. Now, over your years of learning, you've developed a sense of music that gets away from bluegrass a lot of times. What kind of music do you like and do you listen to? And how did you uh, end up putting all these elements of pop and jazz and stuff into your bluegrass banjo playing? I'm not sure if there is a, any logical explanation to it. I enjoy like bebop kind of music and, uh, and some of the fusion kind of play. And I think a lot of it is beyond my musical knowledge and abilities. I love those sounds. But I grew up playing with a guy named Bill McCauley in Chattanooga. He was doing, you know, Waylon Jennings tunes, Willie Nelson tunes. The band was called Bluegrass Express. So I was playing banjo and trying and having to make these chords flow and everything like gentle on my mind and stuff would teach me like, oh, wow, there's little movements. And then I started getting with my father-in-law on steel guitar and hearing all these chord voices and voicings and learning how to how to move them some and and then playing some western swing with him and all these country tunes but also playing bluegrass it all kind of turned up into a, a big stew of notes and and styles and you'd really put them all together just naturally obviously without you weren't really on a course to i want to learn to play bebop you were just were exposed to it and it kind of worked its way into your playing right that's right, and it's still a desire to be more knowledgeable. I still, I've been playing 45 years, and I keep saying, I want to go to school and, and then I take jazz guitar and learn how to play these uh, modes and scales and stuff more. But, but yeah, I'm primarily an ear player that's learned enough tricks to, to fake it through it, you know, but I really want to actually give things a name and pursue it even further. You got to a point in your career that a move to Knoxville seemed to be a good idea. How did that come about? Was you, were you offered a job there or did you just head over and see what was going on? I actually had a job before I moved here. At the time I was trying to find, you know, in Chattanooga there, there was the night scene playing the clubs and playing the private parties like I do with Bill and a couple other bands. I was trying to get a day job. I had trouble finding what I wanted and then I got a call to come to Dollywood. They had uh, relieved one of the guitar players in a bluegrass band. They had three weeks left. So I came up as a as acoustic guitar player with a, a bluegrass band, Sitico Creek was the name. And then there was a, another band, a show band that the Smith brothers had there. And they heard me playing guitar and they offered me the guitar playing. Bluegrass band offered me a job and the other band offered me a job which they were playing more. They had a night gig poolside plus the Dollywood gig. So after that winter, I, I moved back up there full time 30 years ago, and I'm s still here making, making racket for them. At a certain point in time, you got associated with the guitar. Had you always played guitar a little bit, or did you just pick it up for that particular gig? When I was younger, we'd go to these fiddle contests. I had buddies that would, uh, they play, uh, fiddle they played mandolin play guitar and so what we figured out while we were there we could all play a little bit of every, enter everything I, I got where i worked up some flat picking tunes but i still play with the finger picks but it's still all the flat picking licks it didn't flow like a rolling finger style playing so i still sound like a flat picker just with a little pick noise maybe <laughs> mm -hmm. but i started entering those contests I'd play guitar and then I wound up getting a mandolin and I've learned enough. I probably couldn't hold down a job as a mandolin player, but I could play enough tunes to enter the contest. I said, well, if we get 25 bucks, that's gas money. The guitar started there. And then I really, my father-in-law and a friend, uh, Bobby Burns wanted to put a Western swing band together with my brother-in-law, Herbie on drums. And so we started doing a lot of uh, Western swing, twin harmony stuff. And 
So I, was, I started fooling guitar then, and that's when I started reading charts more, too, when I was 15 or 16. Now, you've uh, acquired the nickname Biscuit. I've never heard where you got it. Why don't you tell us where that came from? Well, I, if you can see through this banjo, I'm kind of hiding the answer behind it. <laughs> now, when I moved to uh, Pigeon Forge playing with the Smith family, the, they had a band called South Star their guitar player had moved on. So when I moved up playing lead guitar, that was what I, that's why I moved to Pigeon Forge doing that. And I, uh, they said, well, our old guitar player had a nickname of Cornbread. So we'll just call you Biscuit. And I was like, that's not my name. I don't really appreciate, I thought it was derogatory to call me that, you know? Mm. Then I got thinking, you know, well, I'm new to town. I could go around causing all kinds of trouble and nobody will know who I am. They'll just say, that biscuit guy, they'll go, well, who's that? So, <laughs> but, so the name stuck. I, I do have a little story about that. There's a restaurant. When I moved up there, I was broke. I was staying in a little efficiency place and there was a, a restaurant called The Farmer's Daughter. And this is a story I tell everybody was, is how I got my name was, I would go over there and eat once a day and they, at right at the, they only served breakfast. So about 1.30, I'd show up, they close at two. I'd go in, they had all you could eat, cat head biscuits and sawmill gravy for $1.99. So I'd go in there and order that at closing time and they'd bring a big bowl of them, biscuits out and gravy and I'd order a picture of water. And then at the end of it, I'd ask for my 10% local discount. <laughs> That's how I lived for that summer. At the end of the summer, they went out of business. So I guess I ate, ate them out of business. So that's how the name Biscuit stuck. <laughs> and it did stick. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you, you, you talked about it just a little bit or touched on it. Uh, your association with Dolly Parton, I mean, that came in little steps, but it became a big part of your career. Uh, let's let's talk about your time with Dolly and how how from baby steps you ended up being a, a band leader and producer. I think I was infected with Dolly Parton from my first year of playing and not realized it. It was like there was a path through the whole thing to wind up playing with her. I, when I was learning to play when I was 10, I'll get up to that real quick, but there was a little band, a family band, and the, the mother played a lot of, and sang do, a lot of Dolly songs. So they would come over and practice at my dad and mom's house, Maud Millsaps. She took her guitar and went into a little spare room and took me in there and I was, I was just starting to learn how to make a G chord or a D chord. And, and, the, and she taught me the coat of many colors. That was the first song I was ever able to uh, uh, chop or vamp rhythm to. And then wound up working at Dollywood and, uh, and then while I was doing that f first year up there, Uncle Bill took Dolly to Nashville and Uncle Lewis, all of her uncles and Dorothy Joe that wrote Code of Many Colors. I wound up, they said that we want you in the band. I played lead guitar for them and then uh, added banjo on certain songs and stuff, but played lead guitar for them for 12 years. And uh, so she was obviously aware that I was around them and I, I was, we were all good friends and family. I even spoke at a couple of funerals for them. And then uh, Richie Owens came in, which is Dolly's first cousin. And he was a producer on her TV show out in Hollywood. He came in and played a season or two and we've got to play in together. So when he would work on something for Dolly, I was the one that wound up playing guitar and I would help write charts, number charts and help kind of with Richie do some of his arranging or if he is busy he would say here do this for me and so cumulatively we did it together and we did several things with her he, he uh, had studios and he recorded her on a lot of stuff and produced it with her so after that she called one winter I guess 2000 I got a phone call back in November and uh, she's and I answered and I didn't know the number it was Dolly Parton on the phone Hey, this is Dolly. <clears throat> oh, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, right. But you could tell it was Dolly. And she said, uh, we've been playing a lot together over the years. Won't you just quit what you're doing and play with me full time? So 
I'm like, wow, through all of this, this is how I, I wound up. Uh, she knew what I could do because I played on two or three of her albums prior to and a lot of to that and, and a lot of demos with her. So that's how I got, to, got in with Dolly. Now you ended up actually producing uh, one of the tour videos and records, correct? Yeah, uh, co-produced with Dolly, the uh, Halos and Horns. She had uh, Little Sparrow and uh, The Grass Was Blue, which won Grammys in the bluegrass category. Then she came up here and got a hold of me and said, uh, I want to cut an album in East Tennessee with all East Tennessee players. So we did that in, uh, in Knoxville at Southern Sound, Danny Brown's recording studio. It was spent a little time on that and wound up, I'd go, I'd go up to her home here in the mountains and just two of us sitting there and I'd have a little, little recorder and a guitar and she would sing these songs and then, I, you know, how we could hear chord changes. And, and she's, she's a player and a musician too, so she has a good idea what she wants. And then we just talk about arrangements and I would pin something down real quick and play it. And she'd sit there in a straight back chair, cross-legged uh, and sing, you know, and we'd work these out. And then I'd bring them home and define them a little more and write charts and arrange who played where, how it worked, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and then we went together at the studio and, and put it down. And that Halos and Horns wound up nominated for a Grammy that year, but they bumped it up to country because she wanted drums. And they uh, wound up with uh, Richard Dennison and Vicky and everybody putting a choir on, on several songs. So they bumped it out of bluegrass and put it on into the country. And we wound up nominated and sitting there watching the Grammys on TV and they, and you see Halos and Horns come up by Dolly Parton nominated with against Reba McIntyre and Alan Jackson and everybody. And we didn't win, but you know, this getting a nod is a, is a huge thing, I think. It certainly is. And you really, as a co-producer, got to be very proud of that project. Let me switch gears a little bit here. In addition to being a great player, you've got a really strong reputation as a wonderful entertainer. Was that something you developed to work more? Or how, how did you become the biscuit guy that the, everyone loves so much? You know, you can tell I stutter all the time when I talk. So I'm just, I'm real backward. I mean, I think I was 23 before somebody told my dad said I, I didn't even realize he could talk to hide behind uh, to hide my uh, I guess uh, introvertedness or however you want to say it I would be goofy so uh, but when I play in the theaters you know I've got the thing there always has to be the goofy guy in the band and everybody was serious so so I would laugh and goof around and hide behind the banjo to hide, hide my shyness because I'd rather do that than have to talk to you right now you know like I'm I'm real backwards when it comes to what to say and uh, but then I've developed a little thing where I would spin around put it behind my head it's like well uh, Jimi Hendrix played behind his head and then uh, we were playing theater a theater in the round there up in a uh, pigeon forge at the stampede so I'd spin I just turned slowly it's like well everybody's going to want to see that wow he can play it behind his head and that one day I was spinning a little bit and just going around, I started going faster and faster. So, well, let's see how fast I can go. So then I wound up looking like a, you know, a fat ice skater <laughs> spinning around playing banjo behind my head. <laughs> well, it's, it's something that obviously people love. I want to make sure that I ask the question, you really want to be known as a musician, not a comic, correct? I do. And uh, comedy is just to cover up uh, shyness and, you know, and the, fill in dead spots in the show uh, so it doesn't have that. You want to make the show, you know, while they say dead air kills in, in a show. So you keep that full, whatever you got to take, do to do it. So, and as a musician, I want to be noted as a musician and I'm proud of what I play and what I know. And then I'm embarrassed for the lack of knowledge I have too. So, you know, if you combine the two, I, I want to be the, the trained musician that can still have feeling in their music. 
Well, uh, it's, it's obvious you are a very, very musical guy. You start there, even with the simplest technique, the sincerity of your music always comes through. And you have obviously gotten way, way beyond the simplest technique. But it's all, you can always hear your heart coming through your music. It's one of the things I've always enjoyed about listening to you. It's, a, it's very, very sincere. So we certainly love what you're doing right now. Let's, let's move on. I, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but I want to make sure everyone understands uh, how your life evolved around Herbie Wallace. And, uh, and from Herbie Wallace, it went a little further. Tell us about your connection with him and how it changed your music and life. When I first met Herbie, he was a, he, he came in and I saw everybody would talk about Herbie, how great he was. And I, I, I'm just a banjo player. I didn't know the difference. And but then when I played the first job with him, Bill, Bill McCauley had hired him on. We got this steel guitar player going to come play with us. And as soon as we hit the first song, we're used to our three piece sound. And as soon as he touched the thing, it was like this big wall of sound started coming through. And I was like, it smacked me upside of the head like, wow. So this is big sound. And how, how is he doing that? So I started trying to create more chordal things to feel like a steel guitar player than more than a banjo player. And then after moving and playing in the groups with him, I started learning uh, how to play, you know, you play lead, you play harmony. I started understanding that more and having to write charts for those songs taught me all that. So Herbie introduced all that into my world. And then when we moved up, up with little Herbie, we moved to uh, East Tennessee. And then a year later, Herbie moved up playing in shows and we wound up playing some of those shows together, but learning in even more in depth about when they're writing, they had a Nashville producer write the charts. So I'm over here playing lead guitar and I'm asking Herbie, uh, what's a half diminished? Yeah. So he would, he would start explaining, you know, well, it's these notes out of the scale and it substitutes looks like this little things like that, which aren't little started. Oh, so I've got little stepping stones between major chord changes, all of that stuff, Herbie, introduced and made me just woke up all the senses and made me more aware of what I needed and and at this point still to this day it makes you aware of what you don't know when you hear all these other players. Also another benefit in your life to meeting Herbie correct? Oh yeah buddy. Woo son. <laughs> that's little Jenny Lynn. <laughs> yeah yeah Jenny Jennifer that's uh that's my beautiful wife and Buddy, you talk about a songbird. That girl can sing. Got one of the prettiest voices. And she'll sing. She can sing Ella Fitzgerald tunes. It's, it's amazing. She's really a talented girl. She was doing guitar and had a little car accident. Not a little one, but kind of messed her hand up. So she let the music side go. But her, her vocal abilities are really amazing. Then by getting to meet, meet Jenny. I mean, Jenny was running around in Chattanooga when I'd go over their house, but she, you know, she chased me till I caught her, but she was, she was like a, she was just a kid running around in the house because we're 11 years apart. So I didn't know, nope, we didn't pay each other any attention until she, they all moved up to East Tennessee in uh, Pigeon Forge, Sevierville area. Let me ask you about your instruments. Uh, you've gone through or been seen with a couple of different banjos and they all sound great. Uh, what gravitates you towards the Gibson or the Ohm or any of the other banjos you play? And what are your favorites? They all have a different sound. Uh, the sound is a lot of it. The feel of it, you know, is a lot. And, you know, each instrument will make you think different when you play based on how it's set up or, or how it sounds. So I like different different um different sounds like this ohm i'm playing now it it's kind of in your face and all the notes are real clear and it just feels right to me but i use it for specific purposes i got another ohm that i i won at winfield and uh, the southern cross and it has a total different sound the way it's set up so 
I have it set up more for plugging in electric and then the Gibsons, you know, I, I like the bling too, but it's not all about that. But the, the tone of them are different. You got low, what we call the tubby uh, traditional sound or the tight uh, arch top kind of sound. They're all different techniques or textures to them. So if I pick one up, if I played the same banjo all the time, I, I would, I like it, but sometimes just picking up one that sounds a little different will make you creative, creativeness uh, come out in a different way. Absolutely. One of the things you've been really active in throughout your life and career is teaching, teaching others. Let, let's just touch on that. Uh, some of the joy you get out of teaching, some of the most satisfaction you get out of it. And uh, talk a little bit about you. You mentioned how you teach today. I guess I so I was asked to give somebody lessons when I was 12. I started teaching when I was 12. And on Mondays, I would give four or five lessons. I wound up, and a lot of them, you know, all I did was pattern after my first teacher, Johnny Wooten, a great guy, great teacher, explained it. And, uh, and everything was clear in the Earl Scruggs style. So um, I teach like he did to begin with, and then I incorporate the knowledge through all the years. But I, I love teaching because, you know, somebody there, like now, their goal is they, they heard a banjo and they say, wow, I want to do that. Just like me hearing it the first time. And they think, you know, like some instruments, you can play single string and just play a simple melody. But the Earl, the back three finger style, you got these pat right hand patterns. You got to get them up to speed before the song will sound like the song. As students all the time now say, well, I'm playing it like, just like you taught me, but it, it don't sound the same. And I say, well, you're wanting, you practice the song more than you practice your technique down here for speed. And everything is not speed, but in the three finger world, we're, using, we're playing double time on most people of every rest of the band. So it is speed to get those sounds. But, so to encourage them and then to see their excitement, just like I had, and my goal, I tell them all when they take their first lesson, I said, my goal is to find the student that I can teach everything I know in one lesson, and you walk out of here and go get on Rhonda Vincent's bus and start making a living. And so uh, that's the goal as a teacher, to see them mature from uh, barely crawling. It's just, I guess it's like having a baby. They start in and you're, they're fussy, and well, I don't want to play <laughs> like that, and, or it's too slow, or and to see them hit those plateaus and get to a point to where, you know, some of the students have turned into uh, professional st uh, musicians making a living doing it now, as you, you've had, I'm sure, too, through the years. To see that, it's just a big reward. Yeah, and, and then how they take it, and then you give them just enough. I say, well, you get to a point, then, then I'll cut you loose and you go out and learn from everybody and listen to everybody you you develop your own way of thinking and how to approach things with live performance virtually disappearing during this crazy time we're going through a lot of musicians are getting really creative and how they're sharing their music how do you see the music business landing on its feet after all this covid nonsense uh, kind of calms down that's a tough one there when you've played for almost 50 years and, and it's just, uh, you're traveling so fast, your face is about to peel off and, and you've got a, a trail you're running. And then for that to stop, and then this whole new way of thinking, I'm still trying to figure that out for myself. I think the uh, virtual thing eventually will be a lot of the way to, that, that it's going as we're doing right now, live performance. It's going to come back. I don't know when, if the crowds with everybody crowded together, like when we played with Dolly in, uh, in New York City and everybody's standing like it was a big mosh pit, you know, downtown New York and everybody's piled on each other like a rock concert. That's, those days are gone, I bet. But I hope they can come back eventually. But let's get on to a happier thought. You, you just touched on a, a great moment when people are sitting there with uh, crowding around the stage and adoring the music. 
trying to think back. Uh, some of the great moments on stage or some of the great gigs you've had. Uh, a lot of the more uh, memorable moments, I guess, were with Dolly. But when I was, uh, let's see, be th I was 13 years old. I played, uh, I was invited by the Smithsonian to, with a bunch of the uh, Southeast fiddle champions and their rhythm guitarists to represent the South in the bicentennial celebration. So for a week in uh, Washington, DC, 13 years old, never been on an airplane. And mom and dad drives me down from Chattanooga to, to Birmingham to get on an airplane. And I'm like, and uh, it, it was scary. When I, when I got there, it, it was a, a neat experience. The, back then to be televised worldwide, an event, it was huge. And I got to play on the main stage on the 4th of July that evening, televised nationwide. And then they took us over to the Smithsonian and they, uh, the Museum of Folk Life and had little snippets of, of the event. And, and they showed me standing there playing banjo on the main stage beside the reflection pool. And I was like, wow, I think I, think I just became a star and didn't realize it. <laughs> A great memory indeed. Let's ask a real question, tough question, especially right now in the midst of the COVID thing. Your son, Connor, he's a, a musician, but he's also a wonderful scholar. If he ever wanted to follow your career path as a musician, would you encourage him or would you tell him, ah, you might want to think that one out, son? Uh, as I have told him, I said, if you decide you want to play some music, uh, do it, but do finish school. You need that to fall back on when things like now is going on with the COVID. You can't go out and play live if you're not if you're not uh, polished enough and know the right people. It's hard to get on gigs if they're any available or get on recordings. You have to have reputation plus uh, the experience to do it. So all of that combined, it's easier if you'll just go ahead and spend the extra time in school and and get your degree and have that to fall back on if it happens to not be your main source. That's good fatherly advice. Now let's one more time go back to Winfield. You've been the national banjo champion four times. Uh, it's got to be a great source of pride for you. Yeah, I, I was uh, shocked when I won it and they told me it was a national championship the first time. And then to, when I won it the fourth time and they, I went up to receive the trophy and the banjo and they announced that I was the only person to ever win any of, of their categories, you know, guitars or whatever. I was the only one so far to ever win four times. And uh, that, that's a huge honor because uh, I've got friends that go every year and I, I couldn't afford to go every year and I, I was busy usually. So I went uh, the second time in 86 and got second place. It was a year my mom passed away. My dad was grieving and, and I said, let's load up and just go to Winfield. It's this weekend. So unrehearsed, just show up and play. And then uh, 88 went back, didn't go back till 96 and then set out 16 years and went back in 80, uh, 2012. So to, to place or win in the years that you go was huge. Uh, I, I felt honored and nervous and scared because there's no guarantee in that contest. They just judge you off your music and your, your abilities. They're, they can't see you. All they can do is hear your music. That's a big nod, I think, and a, a true honor. It's a historic accomplishment you've made. Before we let you go for the day, I want to ask one final question. There's still a lot of life and, and years left in, in your life and your career. Is there anything in your head that you're really hoping to accomplish? Maybe a special project or a special idea? Maybe another Winfield triumph? You know, I have a lot of, I still, you know, I've been playing a long time. We all have a as professional musicians, we want to know more about music. Like I keep saying, my goal is to be able to uh, play like a, a pack cap cloud kind of style on the banjo and understand the music and, or, but play it in my way. 
do, do the fusion kind of stuff, do a, a recording, you know. I want to play all styles, not just be noted for one style. And I don't want to be noted as a contest player. I want to be the musician. Sometimes you can get categorized instead of uh, being known for like you can do anything. I want to be the anything guy, but be good at all of them. So I guess I'll uh, travel that that path uh, until I can't. <laughs> well, Gary, thank you on behalf of all the folks listening today for sharing all this insight. It's a real treat to hear it from your own lips and you've had a great life and career and we hope many, many more years. Gary Davis, thank you so much. Thank you, Johnny. Thanks, the Hall of Fame. And what an honor. I really appreciate you guys.